Amen. If you would now turn to page 490. While you're turning there, I wanted to announce that there will be a Christmas program, Christmas play meeting with Miss Twyla immediately following service. And it'll be very brief, I believe. And uh, then I also want to mention to be in prayer. If you would pray for YouthCon there in the city, um, we have about 28 or 29 signed up to go to that. Just pray that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the Lord will be with us and the ministry there at Heartland. And then also, August 28th will be our youth kickoff and our WANA's uh, start. Um, and so that'll just be three or four weeks. So be in prayer also as we look forward to putting that together. We'll need van drivers and teachers and people supporting us in prayer as we get our youth program kicked back off. So I know that'll be exciting. Turn to page 490. Lead me to Calvary. Page 490. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thy slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for Thee. Even Thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget Thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Amen. Page 447 will be our last congregational, Trust and Obey. Exciting. Tonight we get two more baptisms, Brother Caleb Skaggs and Isaac Turner. Going to be following the Lord in baptism tonight, and that's exciting. Amen. We had about half a dozen this morning. The devil didn't like that, so we sprung bathroom leaks in both buildings. <laughs> I, I'm blaming the devil on that, amen, but, uh, but God is good, and we're going to go ahead and do 447, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Let us do his good will. He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not 
what a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Amen. Before Dad comes and preaches, our youth are going to come and sing the hymn of heaven. If our youth choir that knows hymn of heaven will make their way up here, what a blessing to have them. And uh, if you know this, you can sing along with them. I love that idea. I tell you what, with uh, all the prospective future stresses and issues coming up, I look forward to seeing Jesus. Amen? So we'll sing this out.
Hallelujah. Amen. You all know what an alumni gathering is. I was just thinking, if the Lord gives me a few more years, or even if He gives me 20 more years, I want to get the names of all these kids, bring them all back for an alumni at my funeral, and sing that song. I don't want anybody crying. I want everybody shouting. Praise the Lord. The hymn of heaven. Let's all stand together and open your Bibles to the book of Psalms chapter 25. Let me give you just a little bit of, um, before I get right into the message, I'd shared with some of the men this morning that uh, I was a little uneasy about what the Lord wanted me to preach tonight. And uh, so I got with several of the men this morning. We were praying, and a couple of the men, um, of course, had no idea. And in their prayers, um, they prayed in such a manner that I feel like I had confirmation on what God wanted me to preach tonight. And so if we look there in Psalms chapter 25... You'll get the gist of this real quick. I told you this morning that the title to the message would be two words, decisions, decisions. And I've often wondered why it is that after many years of experience uh, and in reading history, uh, even in the pages of Scripture, it makes me wonder why so many people who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in our day, Christians, why we make such ill-advised decisions. And it gets real quiet when I say that. Uh, but I want you to think about that with me. Why is it that we oftentimes make ill-advised or unwise decisions? And you might say, well, preacher, we lack wisdom. I agree. But the Bible says if we lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask of God and he'll give us wisdom. I've had people to say, preacher, I need, I need clear direction. And yet the word of God could not be clearer when it comes to basic life decisions that we make from day to day. And so I think it's important that we, in a very, very short period of time, and in a small manner, answer the question of why it is that we as believers make such ill-advised, unwise decisions. So with that said, Psalms chapter 25, I want to read several verses. The Bible says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Now, over the next few verses, I want you to pay attention to a couple of different words. The word teach and the word lead in these next verses. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. Now, you're right there close, so go over to chapter 27 and look there beginning with verse number 11. And again, 
pay attention to the word teach and lead. Verse 11, the Bible says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Decisions, decisions. There are the wise and there are the unwise, or the other wise, as we have somewhat laughed about here at Lindsay Chapel. It is my prayer that as we look at the Word of God, that we would allow the Lord to lead us and guide us into a path of right decisions. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful to you. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for the joy we have in Christ. God, I thank you for our young people. And Father, I know that they are targets, God. Lord, when a young person says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Lord, it's like a target in this crazy and dark world. So, Lord, I pray for parents. God, I pray for grandparents, Lord, that they're the guardians, Father, of these young people. God, that they might be inspired evermore, Father, to watch over and to care for and to protect these young people that you have put in our care. God, help us that we might teach them the principles of your word so that they may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God, help us to be what you want us to be, and we'll give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, and you can be seated. Now, I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 14 with me. Proverbs chapter 14. And let me answer, at least in part, the question that we started with. Why do believers, why do Christians oftentimes make unwise or uh, ill-advised decisions? And I think that answer is partially answered or maybe even totally answered in these next few verses that I'll show to you. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 12, the Bible says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, that same verse is quoted again in chapter 16 and verse number 25. If you'll look there with me, the Bible says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so, if we want to answer in brief, why is it that oftentimes Christian people make bad decisions or ill-advised decisions, decisions that go against the Word of God, we can partially answer that question by looking at those two verses because there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends of, the ends of that is death, and therefore it's obvious that the way that seems right unto a man is not the way that seems right unto God. And so you have the conflict of God's desires or God's will and man's desires or man's way or direction, and they are in direct conflict one with the other. Now, I'm not asking you to turn there because you will have this verse memorized. At least I hope you have partially memorized. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6 gives a remedy for the problem of making unwise decisions. Now, I want to make sure you are all awake. Um, this morning, uh, now after Pastor Clay got to preaching this morning, some of you guys really woke up, I'm telling you, and I could hear those amens behind me. If you couldn't say amen to what Pastor Clay preached this morning, we'll have an invitation a little bit, and you can get saved, and then you'll be on the right track. Uh, because I'm going to tell you what, he shelled the corn this morning. Um, I, I, I was so excited to hear such a biblical explanation of what we all oftentimes just believe that everybody ought to know. But once again, 
what he preached this morning illustrated one of the reasons why people make bad or unwise biblical decisions is because we don't know why we believe what we believe and we're not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So there's a way that seems right to me, but if the end thereof is the way of death, then obviously the way that seems right to me is the wrong way. And so we need to get on uh, the right track. Now, with that said, Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse 5 and 6, that we all, at least many of us, have memorized. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge God, and he will, help me, direct thy path. Now, if God is directing my path, would it be fair to say, or if God is directing my direction, would it be fair to say that I'm going to make right choices? If God is directing me, then I'm going to make right choices. I'm going to make the right decisions because God will never, ever lead you wrong. You're going to hear me say some things tonight that you've heard over and over. The Word of God never changes. The Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you're going to hear some things that you'll say, Preacher, I've heard you say that before. The Word of God will never, ever lead you in the wrong direction. And all of God's people ought to say, Amen. Amen. Stay with the Word of God. Did you know that preachers, pastors teachers like we have here at Lindsay Chapel. We love the Lord and it's our prayer that we would never ever lead anybody in the wrong direction. But we are men and we are capable of failing you. But this word of God will never fail you. This word of God will never change. This word of God will never lead you in the wrong direction. The other day I saw something and it, it kind of just gave me an illustration and it kind of came together this morning after I was praying with some of the men. I saw a car that was obviously going the wrong direction on a ramp. They thought they were going on an on-ramp and they were actually going up the other ramp. Now there was a big sign right there that said, Do not enter. And a little further, there was another sign that said, wrong way. And they just kept going. Now, I didn't get to see the end of it, but I do know that there was not an accident that occurred. So obviously, at some point in time, even after they went past the wrong way sign, they got off the highway far enough to avoid a very tragic and deadly accident. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I believe the person who ignored the first sign, ignored the second sign, they thought they were going the right way. But that way, the end thereof would have been death had something not intervened. As a matter of fact, I was reminded of a very, very tragic, very, very tragic event that took place about 30 years ago. Right over here by Henrietta, just off Interstate 40, a lady that we knew very, very well pulled off in a rest area. She got turned around. I don't want to give a lot of detail here, but she got her directions turned around when she got in her vehicle and drove off, she drove onto the own ramp head on into an 18 wheeler and took her life. Now she thought she was going the right way, but the end thereof was death. There is a way that seemeth right, but we better make sure that it's the right way, otherwise, it may be the end thereof is death. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate here, but it is vital that we answer the question, how can we avoid making bad decisions? You see, I'm going to, again, I'll quote this oftentimes, there is a way that seemeth right, but there is also direction in the Word of God. There is direction that will always send us on the right path. You see, if we take the right path, if we make the right decision, the end thereof will be peace and joy and love and fulfillment because that's what awaits us at the end of right decisions, making 
the proper choices. Every Christian that I know faces difficult decisions almost on a daily basis. There seldom a day goes by that we don't have to make a decision that may make us a little bit uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I believe that Miss Deb and I have made a habit for many, many years of praying every morning before I leave the house. And, and we pray, God, give us wisdom for the day. Give us wisdom for the day. And you might say, well, preacher, you do the same thing just about every day. So, I mean, why do you have to pray for wisdom every day? Because even though, even though it may be the same decisions that we have to make every day, they seem to always come with just a little different suit on. Just a little different something about it. And we need to pray for God's wisdom. And guys, I just want to broaden this. We don't just need to pray for God's wisdom when it comes to the, the obviously spiritual things in our lives. Guys, we run a ranch. We run a cattle business. And, and I'm you, I don't have the wisdom to do that. I do not have the wisdom to run the business that God has given us. We have to pray every day that God will give us wisdom to make the right decisions in whatever we do. You might say, well, that's not really a spiritual issue is. It's a spiritual issue if that's how you live. It's a spiritual issue if that's how God has provided for you to feed your family. Then that becomes very important. And we need to pray that God would give us wisdom and a clear direction for where we are going and how that we are to arrive there. And so the Word of God gives us clear direction in every area of our life. You see, the issue is not the lack or absence of direction, but rather following the clearly stated direction of the Word of God. There are several reasons, and I could give many, but I'll just... Just hit a few this evening. There are several reasons why believers make wrong decisions. But I believe they can pretty much be narrowed down to the simple refusing to, refusing to seek the will of God and then wait on the answer. Now, we are a very impatient people. As a matter of fact, uh, you, we always tell off on our age here, but how many of you can remember when a vending machine was kind of like it was almost exciting to go to a place where there was a vending machine. I mean, you, you, could, you could put a quarter in. Now, this will age us. You could put a quarter in and get a Pepsi. You put a quarter in now, and a little red, little red light comes up and says $1.75. You put another quarter in, $1.50, and by the time you put four quarters in, you might get a mini Dr. Pepper. But, but when we were growing up, it was a big deal to get to use a vending machine. As a matter of fact, uh, Clay, and, Clay you, he and him and our daughter embarrassed us. We were somewhere and there was a vending machine. And uh, somebody said, hey, there's some kids out there trying to rob that machine. And Clay and Casey was out there. They saw people putting money in it. And they thought the more they shook it, the more it would come out. The more they were shaking the vending machine. <laughs> Boy, Miss Deb raised some terrible kids. <laughs> Now, you might say, well, where are you going with that? Vending machines were given to us because we are always in a hurry. We don't want to wait. And so instead of pulling up to a window and ordering, you just drop a quarter in the machine. You get whatever you want. You go on your way. They were for convenience. Now, I could go a lot of places with, with that illustration. I'm just saying we are not a people that are accustomed to waiting. Somebody told me the other day they had bought a new computer, and, I, and I'm, I'm technologically illiterate, so bear with me. They were getting another computer, and I said, what happened to your other computer? And they said, it's too slow. Now, they, I don't know anything about it. I, they said it was too slow. And I said, what do you mean it's too slow? And they began to explain to me that whenever they asked the computer for a certain thing, that it actually took about three seconds, and that was too long. They wanted it. And I'm going, are you slap kidding me? I mean, are, are, so, how many of y'all got a computer and you know what I'm talking about and I don't? I mean, it's like we have to have it now. That's one of the reasons we make bad decisions. is because we will never be elevated to the position that we can demand God to answer us now. Are you okay? Say amen. 
we will never be elevated to the spiritual position that we can demand of God the answer that we want now. That's why the Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. And you can read that in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. But there are major, major blessings that will come when we decide that if I'm going to get clear direction from God, I have to wait on His timing. And, and many times we're not willing to wait. We, we pray about a situation one time, and if we don't get an answer by in the morning at 8 o'clock, there's a way that seemeth right to me, and that's what I'm going to do. Because God didn't give me a clear answer. Or... We're listening to counsel that does not line up with the Word of God, and so we go that direction if it comes immediate. I've had people say, well, I prayed about it, and man, it was just like a miracle. I prayed about it, and just like that, I got a text, and the text confirmed. And, I, and I remember, I've had these conversations. I said, well, what did the text say? And it was totally against the Word of God. But it came quickly. It came first. It came. And so because it, I prayed about it and it came, I didn't care whether it was the right counsel or not. But it came quick. Are y'all following me? I, I need to know that y'all are following me. But it came quick. And so we said, that's got to be from God. You might say, well, how can we know if it was from God or not? Does it line up with the Word of God? Amen. Does it line up with the Word, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Word of God? If it does, then we can say, you know what, there's a good possibility that, that came from God. But then we have to also answer the question, does it line up with, you young people, listen, does it line up with my, what my parents, th does it line up with my authorities? Because if it lines up with the Word of God, it will also line up with those <clears throat> who God has put in authority over you. That's tough to swallow, isn't it? Because so many young people, I don't, my mother's here, but I won't ask her. Um, I don't know if I ever went through that stage where my parents didn't know anything. I don't think I ever went through that. We weren't allowed to go through that. My mother wasn't very big, but she swung a big stick. And all I'm saying is simply this. There is a way that seems right, and the end thereof is tragedy. It may not be literal death, but there's a way that seemeth right to a man, <clears throat> and the end of that way is heartache. The end of that way is, is sadness. The end of that way is is tragic and we get to the end of that way and then we wonder and we cry out to God and we wonder how did I get how did I get from that that church service where the preacher was telling me exactly how to how to know the will of God how did I get from there to this tragic end that I'm at now and the answer is simple we didn't allow God to direct our path we didn't trust in the Lord enough trusted the Lord with all your heart, lean not into your own understanding. In all, thy, in all thy ways acknowledge God, and He will direct thy path. So if you end up in that tragic way, if you end up in that way of heartache, listen, just put, it, put the blame where it belongs. Own your sin. Because if you know the Word, you've had access to the Word, and you do not trust in the Lord enough to wait on his answer. Folks, listen. This is not a difficult subject. It is a subject that needs to be dealt with, but it is not a difficult subject. You see, the Word of God will never, ever lead you wrong. Just a few weeks ago, I had a young man stop by the ranch, and with tears in his eyes, he said, Preacher, I remember something that you said years ago. I like that because I've been saying the thing, same thing for years and years because the Word of God never, never, is never changing. He said, I remember you told me one time because I'd made a decision and you were trying to talk me out of it. 
and you said the Word of God cannot be wrong. And I got in my vehicle and drove away and I did what I wanted to do. And he said these years later, I, I believe probably at least 10 years, maybe 12 years later, he said, today I'm living the tragic result. And listen, praise God he had come to the point that he was willing to admit. He said, I'm living the tragic result of a bad decision when I knew the answer. I knew the answer. Pastor Clay told me, you told me, you directed me to the Word of God, you said the Word of God cannot be wrong. Now he didn't say this, I'll say this, but there was a way that seemed right to him. There was a way that seemed right to him, but the end thereof was heartache, tragedy. You see, God wants you to know what his perfect will is. And so, this evening, let me just say this, and I don't have time to even preach this message tonight. I just want to get into it as much as I can, and as God gives time, we'll finish it. If you do not have perfect peace with where you are right now, if you don't have perfect peace with a decision that you are in the process of making, and I believe that all of us are in the process of making some kind of decision. I want, I want you, all of you to listen, okay? If you're looking at your cell phone right now, put that thing down because it's not going to give you the right answer. Whatever decision you are in the process of making, are you willing to say, lead me in thy path, O God? Are you willing to say, I surrender my will to your will because I know that your way is always right, God. Because if you're willing to do that, then God will give you the peace. God will line up all of the things that need to be in line. God will, he'll make it right with his word. He'll make it right with your authorities. He'll make it right and give you peace. But if you don't have that peace, if you don't have that perfect peace, then at the very least, would you slow down? Just slow down and let God speak to your heart. You see, wherever you are today, I can assure you that wherever you are today is a result of a decision that you made yesterday or last week or last year. Wherever we are today is a result of a decision you made earlier. You're in this sanctuary tonight because you decided you were going to be here. Amen? It's a decision. And where you are tomorrow, where you will be next week, will be the result of a decision that you make today or tomorrow. Those are just facts. You see, we must be willing to stop and make certain that our direction is in accordance to the will of God. You may discover that your direction is right. If you'll slow down, pray, you may discover God may confirm that the direction that you're going right now is the right way. And if He does so, then rejoice in that and continue to follow the Lord in the path that He is directing you on. But you may find out that your direction is wrong. If you lay it down beside the Word of God, you talk to your authorities. I, I know that's a dirty word in our culture today, the very thought of somebody having an authority. But it's been stated many times by a lot better preachers than me, the, the, the safest, the best place that you and I will ever be is under proper authority. And if you're an old person like I am, you might say, well, whose authority are you under? I'm under the authority of God. I'm under God's authority. And everything that I do should be aligned with His word and His will. But if you're young and you still have parents, make sure that that direction is in align with what they understand. 
You see, if your present direction is wrong or even questionable, repent of that and turn around. Repent of it and turn around. You might say, but, well, let me give you another reason that people make bad choices. People make bad choices because they're afraid that they're not going to have another chance. They're, they're afraid they're not going to have another chance. I talked to a fellow recently, and he was getting ready to make a, a decision. And, and praise God, he asked to speak to me. I didn't have to go to him. He asked to talk to me. And I said, so why, so why this decision? And he told me it's strictly based on time. Strictly based on time. You might say, what do you mean by that? Well, this opportunity is here now. And if I don't, if I don't make this choice now, I, that, that opportunity may not be there then. Can I tell you guys, it's seldom that we should make major decisions in our lives under the pressure of time. Are y'all following me? It's not, it's not a wise thing to make a decision under the pressure of time. Because God rules time. God, listen, I'm not saying that we need to be paralyzed and, and, and not, not be willing to make a decision. We all have to make decisions. I'm just saying that I can't find a place in Scripture when somebody made a fast, rash decision that it ended well. The Bible says, wait on the Lord. The Bible says to pray. And over and over in the Scripture, it says that we are to pray and that we're to wait on the Lord to give us direction. And we should not allow the pressure of time to, um, and I would say this to some of, especially our young people, you have plenty of time And if you'll wait on the Lord, the end thereof can be peace and joy and fulfillment. But if we push ahead and we, we think, this is, the, this is my opportunity, this is my chance, this is my... And that's the basis of our decision making, I can assure you, there is a way that seemeth right to you. But the end will be heartache. You see, we need to understand that making a slight change or a slight change of direction is not always the answer. Now, let me give a very simple illustration to that. If you're on Interstate 40 and you're heading toward Oklahoma City, you're not going to end up in Fort Smith. Now, is that not a profound truth? How many of y'all just learned something? <laughs> I just, I can't wait. You get out of church tonight, you get on your social media and say, I learned something at church tonight. The preacher revealed an unbelievable uh, truth. If I'm on Interstate 40 and I'm heading to Oklahoma City, I'm not going to get to Fort Smith. Well, where are you trying to get to? Well, I'm trying to get to Fort Smith. <laughs> Pardon the English, you ain't going to get there. And, and here's what we, listen, here's what we do. In a literal sense, this is what we do. And I'm trying to put this on a spiritual level. We discover that we're going the wrong way. But you know what? The westbound lane, they just overlaid it, and it is as smooth as it can be. Got brand new stripes. You can see exactly where you're going. It, it is so smooth. And if I get over in the other lane, they hadn't fixed the lane going eastbound. And that road has got bumps in it. And there's some construction along the way. And I know I need to be going that way, but it's so much smoother going this way. Pardon me, you ain't going to get there. You'll end up in the wrong place, and you may not hit any big chug holes in the way. But the end thereof is tragic. So we do this. We realize we're going the wrong way. And instead of getting off and getting back on and going the 
right direction, we just kind of veer off. We say, okay, I know I need to be down there. And so there's an exit, and I can just veer off right there, and it'll take me, uh, instead of going on toward Henred, it'll take me over there toward Council Hill and that way, and I've changed my direction. No. You've just changed the course of the wrong way. Am I making sense? Guys, listen. When God reveals to us that we're going the wrong way, slight changes is not going to get me on the right path. It's easy to make slight changes. It's easy to, it's easy to say, I know I'm going the wrong way. I need to be going that way. But it's, I mean... Do I have to just do it all at one time? I mean, why do I have to just stop and go the other way? Because that's what repentance is. Right. Repentance is stopping and going the other way. And you can take slight, just slight exits, if you will, along the way. But as long as your general direction is still going the wrong direction, the end thereof is still going to be tragic. It's going to be heartbreak. I think the difference is making small adjustments rather than letting God truly change my direction. God's not interested in small adjustments. When He reveals that we're heading in the wrong direction, He wants us to stop and let Him lead us on the right path. Now, when I was preparing this message in the middle of the day today, I thought this message is going to last 15 minutes. Clay leaned over to me while I go in and said, Dad, remember I'm baptizing tonight. <laughs> He's trying to hurry me up. So I'm trying to hurry. Y'all stay with me. You know that a number of years ago, I had a very, very dear friend in Eufaula. He was about seven or eight years older than me. If I called his name, some of you would know exactly who I'm talking about. He was a very popular young man. He was kind of the best looking kid in the class. And he was a good athlete and all of that. And he allowed that popularity, according to his own testimony, he allowed that popularity to lead him into a very sinful life. A life that started out in very slight ways of going off the wrong path, but ultimately ended up in abusing alcohol and drugs. When he was about 35, he gave his life to the Lord. He got saved. And he truly, truly was a converted man. He, he truly gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he committed that for the rest of his life that he would share his testimony, not the gory details, but just share his testimony to try to lead others in the right way. And I remember one day I was talking to him not long after I'd started pastoring a church. And he said to me, you know, Brother Tim, at this point in time, he was on dialysis and he was near death. And he was in his 30s. And he said, you know, I, I'm grateful to God that I'm saved and I know that when I die that the Lord's going to take me to heaven. But he said, I also realize that the condition that I'm in and the fact that I'm going to die in what most people consider to be a very early age is a direct result of decisions that I made when I was a teenager. A direct result of the decisions that I made. And I said, I, I kind of wanted to come to his defense. And I said, but maybe as a teenager, you didn't know the right answers. And, and he, said, he said, Tim, let me stop you. He said, I knew the right answers. He said, my grandmother raised me in the house of God. He said, I was raised in church. And he quoted that verse to me. I'll never forget it. He said, there's a way that seemed right to me at the time. There was a way, and it seemed right to me at the time. 
but the end thereof is the ways of death. And he said, I know that when I die, I'm going to enter into eternal life. I know that. But I'm just saying the end of those decisions that I made back then because I thought they were right, the end thereof is death. And I just say that to say this. That the decisions you are facing today, however large or however small or whatever the case may be, are you willing, realizing that one direction is peace and joy and fulfillment and God blessed at the end, and the other one could be literally, listen, could literally be heartache and tragedy and, 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 and and even maybe death. Realizing that, are we willing to say, Lord, direct my path? Am I willing to trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not unto my understanding, but acknowledge God in all of my ways and He will direct my path? Guys, let me, I don't think we can even comprehend how much God loves us. He loves us so much that He has given us, literally, He has given us a road map First of all, to heaven, but he has given us a road map where we do not have to hit all the chug holes in the road. We, we don't, listen, we don't have to run into the guardrails. The, the guardrails, praise God that we've got guardrails, but there, Brother Chet, help me here, but we don't put up guardrails so people can just bump up against them and stay, but no, they are, they are for the extreme God gives us direction in a very loving, kind way, and we don't have to hit the guardrails. We don't have to. And so God is willing to give us direction. There are so many things to think about here. Pastor Clay, I know we're going to baptize here in a moment, but (laughs) this is good stuff. God wants us to make right decisions. He is not hiding His will from us. I looked in the Bible this afternoon about men that that listened to God and made right decisions and what the end thereof. And I'll just throw these at you. You can look at them in your quiet time. When you have some time with the Lord, go all the way back to Genesis and, and, and look at Noah. Man, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God gave Noah some direction. Now, I want you to think about this. God gave Noah some direction. He said, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. You might say, yeah, but Ben, that was so, that was so simple. No, no, I'm, yeah, I mean, it was simple in as much as he said, I want you to build me an ark. And then you read the rest of the story. And the Bible says, and, and what what God commanded Noah to do? Noah did. Do you know why we talk about Noah today in the, in the manner that we talk about him? Because he took the right path. He didn't argue with God and say, God, you know, um, you want me to build a what? An ark? Like a boat? For what? Well, because a boat can float. And Noah goes, on what? No, I didn't do that. Sometimes we demand of God details. And he's not obliged to give us details unless he chooses to. Many times we hear the will, we hear God's will, we know what his will is, but we want every detail along the way so that we can decide whether or not we want to commit to that will. And you know what? Many times he leads us into his perfect will by faith alone. Did you know that these men, these, these men of God came to my mind. I thought about Moses. And God called Moses, and we know about the beginning of that calling and how Moses, he said, Lord, here am I. And the Lord said this in Exodus beginning chapter 3. And in and then the Lord said, uh, Moses, here's what I want you to do. And Moses says, starts making excuses. Now, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that Moses, in a very humble way, 
was just explaining to God what he saw was his deficiencies. But guys, if, if God calls you, he can make your deficient efficient. Okay, he, that's what he does. And so I, I got to get this picture. So Moses, God says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And so here's Moses who walks up to Pharaoh. I, y'all, I, this is exciting to me. He walks up to Pharaoh and said, uh, God said, let my people go. And I'm sure Pharaoh probably thought, who are you to tell me? Let my people go. Absolutely, I will not let the people go. Would you get out of my face? Now, I'm paraphrasing here. So Moses goes his way. That was the first encounter, if you will. And then God says, "Uh, now I want you to go back and tell Pharaoh again to let my people go. And if he doesn't let my people go, there's going to be a consequence. So here's Moses again. Pharaoh goes, then that guy comes again. Pharaoh probably says, "Uh, what this time? He said, God told me to tell you, let my people go. He said, I told you earlier I wasn't going to let the people go. He said, well, that's just what God told me to tell you. I'm paraphrasing here. What I'm saying is, God gave Moses direction. Sometimes we worry about the result, and so we become disgruntled in the direction. We, We fear the direction because we think that we are in charge of the result. We, we think, well, if it doesn't work out the first time, surely God missed it. And then I want you to get this picture. He wouldn't let them go. And so then God told Moses, you go back and tell him again, let my people go. And if he doesn't let my people go, there's going to be another plague that's going to come. And it went on the first time, and, and there was this plague came, and then here comes Moses back again, and can you imagine about the third or fourth or fifth time that here comes Moses, and Pharaoh's going... That is a pestilent fella. Does he not know that I have the power to cut his head off? Do you think Moses knew that? I think Moses knew that. But let me tell you what Moses had. You might say, well, he had great faith. He did. But he had God's direction. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lead not into thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Moses wasn't worried about it because he knew that whatever lay at the end of that direction was of God. And all these times he kept going back to Pharaoh. And as I, I just tried to picture that in my mind of, of this same guy coming back over and over and over and over knowing every time that it could cost him his life. But he had direction. Guys, listen, God is willing to give us direction. The question is not, is God willing? The question is, am I willing to receive God's direction? So here's the close of this. We have to be willing to remove any obstacles that would hinder me from hearing the voice of God. Get rid of any obstacle that would hinder me from hearing the voice of God. You might say, what are you talking about? I don't listen to the radio, just very, very rarely. But the odds are that you're not going to hear real good Bible preaching In other words, maybe a message from God. If you've got your radio on an old country and western or rock and roll station. Are we okay? I mean, you're not going to hear Adrian Rogers preaching on your rock station. And you're not going to hear the voice of God if you are living in blatant, rebellion against God or against your authorities. You're not going to hear the voice of God. So you need to make sure that you remove the obstacles that would hinder you from hearing the Word of God. All these outside voices. I know there's people around the ranch and uh, primarily Clay 
and even some of our leadership at church that sometimes y'all get a little bit frustrated at me because my hearing is not good and I wear hearing aids and it's, it's, it's a mess and I, and I understand. But do you know one of the things that keeps me from hearing what I need to hear? It's all the background noise. All the background noise keeps me from hearing what I need to hear. That's the point I'm making. We need to remove the obstacles that keep me from hearing what I need to hear. And we've got the world pounding into our ears. The world is constantly pounding into our ears things that are unhealthy, things that are sinful, things that are just simply not necessary. And because of all of that background noise... I miss the voice of God as He gives me clear direction. We need to be alert to advice or counsel that does not align itself with the Word of God. Some people listen more to their friend's counsel than they do the counsel of God. We need to pray, and then we need to rest in the promise that I've quoted to you over and over tonight. We need to rest in a promise we have from God. And so inasmuch as you have this pretty much memorized, I want you to do it with me. Because if we can rest in the promise of God, you will make right decisions. Here's the promise. Help me. Now I'm going to go back to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge God, acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy path. You want to make right decisions? Trust in the Lord and wait on Him. Let's all stand. Those of you that are going to be baptized, if you'll go ahead and make your way uh, back to uh, the proper rooms. Miss Megan, if you'll make your way to the piano, please. We often sing an invitation hymn that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Sometimes we do an invitation that would, if we did what we were singing, we would be so very blessed. And so I want to encourage you tonight Whatever decision you are in the middle of making, will you please, will you please just say, God, I want you to direct my path. I want to make sure that the path that I take is the right one that will lead me to life and peace and joy, fulfillment. Don't let me go down the wrong path. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're not saved tonight, He wants to save your soul. Listen, if you're not a Christian tonight, if you've never been born again, He wants to save your soul from an eternity in hell. He loves you. Died on the cross and He says, I will lead you in the path of righteousness. Are you willing to follow? If you're not saved, I'll meet you right here and somebody will pray with you. And as this morning, I want to ask the question, if you're not saved tonight and you say, Preacher, I I just want you to pray for me. I know that I need to give my life to Jesus. Would you pray for me this week? No one's looking around. If you say, Preacher, that's me, would you lift your hand? Just lift your hand. I'll see it and you can put it right back down. We'll be praying for you. With that said... If you're a child of God, you'd be willing, courageous enough to say, you know, I'm in the middle of a decision, but I don't, I don't have perfect peace about it. Well, if you don't have perfect peace about it, wouldn't it be wise just to slow down and give God, give God the time to give you the right answer?
I've decided to follow Jesus. If no one else goes with me, I'll still follow Jesus. She's going to continue to play as they get ready to baptize tonight. There's some at the altars, and there's time for you. There's room for you. You say, preacher, I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to know the direction that God wants me to go. Certainly, I'd like to know. I don't want to make a bad decision. Well, then go to the Word. Go to the Word and then trust Him. Trust Him through your authorities. Trust Him. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. With heads bowed and eyes closed, go ahead and be seated. She's going to continue. Just continue to play until they come into the water. Invitation still open if you need to come. No turning back, no turning back. Just continue to play until they're ready. Amen. I don't know if you can hear me there, but all right. This is exciting uh, evening. We have two, two of my favorite fellas right here, Brother Caleb Skaggs and Isaac Turner, my son. Caleb, if you'll come on down first. Any of you know Brother Pat and Miss Angie? Brother Pat's been Sunday school teacher here for a long time now, and. Uh, Raising their kids here, and and uh, Caleb's been in church a long time, but just a few weeks before church camp, is that right? Uh, on a Wednesday night, Caleb prayed to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Caleb, have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? You believe he died for you? You believe he rose again? Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and in obedience to his command, I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Isaac? Amen. And this is exciting. This is my son Isaac. Isaac is seven. And uh, Isaac's been hearing the word since he was born, of course. But, um, oh, it's been a few months ago. I think probably before Christmas. He had trusted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And uh, we've waited, but he wanted to be baptized this evening. And so he has been saved. And Isaac, do you believe Jesus died for you? And you believe he rose again? And you've confessed him as Lord. In obedience to the Lord's command and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's all stand together. Cowboy, could I get you to make your way here, please? Great day in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Great day in the Lord. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening. Bible study, uh, 7 o'clock. And hope you'll come and be a part of that. And let's pray for one another. Uh, we all need the prayers of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's pray for one another. Brother, would you dismiss us, please? Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you bless us with, Lord. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Thank you for the decisions of faith of these young kids, Lord, of um, 
have shown publicly, Lord. I pray that, uh, and, and adults, Lord. Lord, I pray that you be with them, Lord, as the devil attacks them. Lord, I pray that you keep their, their heads high, Lord. I pray that they lean upon you. Lord, and I also pray that they know that they have family that they can, that they can lean upon, that, um, Lord, they can pray for them, Lord, that maybe can give them counsel. Um, Lord, I pray that they stick with it, Father, that they don't fall behind the wayside, Lord. Lord, and I just thank you for the, the counsel that was given to me many years ago, Lord, and, and through the years. Lord, it's such a blessing to be able to see um, the fruits of labor, Lord. Father, be with us, Lord. Be with the sick, Father. Um, Lord, go with, go with us through this week. Lord, I pray that um, you just keep us all safe, Lord. Father, and bring us back on Wednesday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.